Jackson Wheeler is our treasure. He supported both visual and poetry, the literary arts. He passed in 2017, and we are so happy that he was part of our community, and I am going to share him with you today in an interview that I did sometime in the middle aughts. Jackson Wheeler. Well, I'll start with the Shaker poem. The last Shaker of Canterbury, New Hampshire, uh, dies in her sleep, and um, it's for Ethel Hudson, who was um, the last Shaker at, at the little community of, in Canterbury, New Hampshire. And it's really interesting because I, um, uh, you know, Phil Taggart and I are, are friends with the poet uh, uh, Robert Peters, uh, who um, wrote a wonderful uh, collection of poems called A Garland for Sister Anne, uh, which is a collection of poems about the whole, the woman who founded sort of the Shaker movement. and. Um, Robert actually had met Ethel Hudson, and um, he said, gosh, he said, in your poem, he said, you make her sound like a much more pleasant person than she was, and uh, he, he told this funny little story about visiting them, and that one thinks of Shakers and simplicity, and he said that the, the house was cluttered, uh, she was still living with two other uh, Shaker women who had died at that time, and he said the house was full of smelly little dogs, and sort of all this fussy uh, gigaws, I think he called them, or whatnots or, or things and uh, things all over. And, and he just remembered the smelly, nippy little dogs and, and these sort of unpleasant uh, old women. Uh, but when I read the obit in the paper, which kind of inspired the poem, I had a, 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 you know, this was a woman I didn't know, so I had uh, no reason, and this was before Robert telling me that anecdote that um, I had no reason to think any differently about her, and I, I was very much attracted by the idea that she was the last, and I, I think Americans more than any other uh, group of people in the world are more interested in lists and things that are first and last and whatever that obsession is, and so what I did was that I I took a quote from. Um, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and it's from the prologue, The Holy Blissful Martyr for to Seek. Um, and uh, so I tried to imagine what it was like, and a lot of people don't realize that the Shakers were a celibate group uh, of individuals, that when people professed the Shaker faith, uh, they then became celibate. Uh, and one of the, the ways that the Shakers uh, continued uh, to bring converts in was that they, at a time in history when it was a rarity, they actually were responsible for creating probably one of the most humane orphanage type systems, and they, and it was um, that they adopted. They would adopt children out of orphanages and raise them, and then as these children reach the age of accountability and they're around puberty. Those children could choose uh, to be Quaker or Shaker or not. Uh, not Quaker, Shaker. They, they could choose to be Shakers or not. Um, and Ethel Hudson herself, I knew, had been adopted. And, and you know, she was one of these children that was taken in and, and um, raised uh, by these people uh, and then professed that religious belief. And I imagine her talking. So this is all fiction, but it's me imagining Ethel Hudson talking about some of that. The last Shaker of Canterbury, New Hampshire, dies in her sleep. At 96, I still dream like a schoolgirl, short autumnal afternoons full of arithmetic and the smoke of leaves and corn stubble burned into ash to be turned into the soil before the ground freezes. Sister Anne peeling apples behind the stove, long fragrant curls of Jonathan and wine sap. Sister Margaret wore a starched cap of muslin, transparent 
as the skin a snake left on the garden wall. She was mistress of the laundry, severe at times, but allowed us orphans to play at tag among the sheets on the clothesline. How they fluttered and billowed like the sails of ships or great white birds held captive. Was I a captive here? Surely I was love's captive, not wanting anything which could not be shared by all. What is the point of a good pie if no one eats it? We were all God's captives, and he required of us a song. With the song, joyful work with our hands, and at the end of the day, rest. At the end of all my days, rest was influenced by, by my upbringing um, is entitled How Good Fortune Surprises Us. And um, this was a poem. I was already a young man. I was uh, attending the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And uh, I really was not fraternity material uh, for uh, lots of reasons. And, and, and I wasn't alone. There were a lot of uh, young people at the university who were not fraternity or sorority material. And most of us uh, ended up uh, gathering at the YMYWCA there on campus, which was um, a very active social uh, organization. At that time, at, at the university, there had been a very bitter and long drawn out strike uh, by the food service workers on the, on the campus at the university and uh, at that time. And the Y, uh, it turned out the, uh, the director of the Y at that time was a woman named Anne Queen. And, and by coincidence, it turned out that Anne was from the mountains as well. She was from um, Jackson County. Uh, and and it turned out that uh, Anne and I were uh, distant cousins by marriage. Her, uh, one of my great great uncles, Sidney Queen, um, was a relative of hers, and uh, so it turned out that we were we had a, a distant sort of relationship. And um, Anne was the mediator for the strike. She had come forward, and um, she was a. Uh, trained as a chaplain, she had attended the Harvard uh, School, Divinity School, Divinity, Divinity School, Harvard, or uh, remarkable woman who had never really lost her sense of who she was, and having been born and raised in Appalachia, and we became fast friends. And it was because of that friendship that she actually talked me in to taking a borrowed truck and driving from Chapel Hill to Bybee, Kentucky, which is this small uh, town, really a wide place in the road, on the western slope of uh, the Appalachian Mountains. And um, I undertook this journey with another friend, not realizing, because I'd never driven that far, realizing how far away Bybee, Kentucky really was. And because I had just glanced at this map and thought, oh, it's just a little above Knoxville, Tennessee. Well, it was almost 300 miles north of Knoxville, Tennessee. And so the drive took a lot longer than, uh, than I remembered. Um, I think I'm exaggerating. I think, I know that somewhere in the middle of the night, I remembered seeing a sign north of Knoxville that said uh, Richmond, Kentucky, which was the nearest big town to Bybee, was, I think it was 182 miles. Um, but then there was something else I saw that night, and this is what this poem is about. How good fortune surprises us. I was hauling freight out of the Carolinas up to the Cumberland Plateau when in Tennessee 
I saw from the freeway at 2 a.m. a house ablaze. Water from the fire hoses arced into luminescent rainbows. The only sound, the dull roar of my truck passing. I found myself strangely happy. It was misfortune on that cold night, falling on someone's house, but not mine. Not mine. You know, as, as, as a gay man, with the tragedy of, of the AIDS epidemic, uh, you know, one of, my, one of my brothers was also gay who, who died uh, during that epidemic in, in 95. And it so turned out that one of my, the man who had published my first book uh, became a dear friend, David Oliveira, who lost uh, many friends in that uh, epidemic, which is ongoing. And, and another publisher, Glenna Lushai, who had a daughter who died uh, uh, of that disease process. And uh, the three of us uh, brought together some of those poems, which were our response uh, to that loss, that loss to that disease process, which at the, which at the time still had a lot of uh, shame around it. Um, a, a lot of people didn't want to talk about the fact that people that they loved had died of that disease. And, and, and part of it was that reluctance to talk about um, uh, issues of um, sexual activity that people engage in, uh, the issues of homosexuality, uh, all of that ambivalence. Um, so there was a, um, a collection of poems, a near country uh, poems of, of loss um, came out of um, that. Uh, and, and the poet Edward Field uh, wrote a lovely little blurb about it. He said that uh, in it, he said that somehow miraculously the sorrow these three poets suffer from life's many losses becomes a music that lifts the spirit as opera does becomes a song of life, poetry's ultimate function. And I think as writers who ch choose or have we've chosen poetry as the medium in which we have found our voice that allows us to talk about these things. Uh, so I had been writing. I, I was one of my brother's primary caregivers the last uh, three months of his life. Um, and I went back to Georgia uh, to Decatur, which is a suburb of uh, Atlanta, and uh, uh, stayed with him until he died. And part of that process w of my coming to terms with, with his death and his changing in that disease process, um, I wrote about it. And, and then, you know, there were, there were uh, other friends that I lost at the time that, uh, that, were, um, that, that I wrote about. But I'd, I would like to read um, um, uh, three or four poems uh, from this collection where I'm addressing either directly or obliquely um, the AIDS epidemic. Directions in Decatur. From Third Avenue to East Lake Boulevard to Ponce de Leon to Peachtree Street to Linden Avenue, this is the way to the hospital. We would know it in our sleep. It is the map of our present life. To make you well, I would walk this route over broken glass, each footprint in Carnadine a stop sign. One thing about uh, Atlanta and, and the area around it is that um, uh, after uh, the Reconstruction period of the American Civil War, uh, there rose up these groups of, of individuals, the Daughters of Confederacy and organizations of Confederate veterans, and, and many of them were responsible for putting up these historical monuments that were depicting uh, various 
historical events around the, the siege of Atlanta, the battle, and, uh, and whatever one's um, feelings are about these people's political beliefs or leanings or what have you, uh, these markers exist. I mean, they're tangible artifacts, and, and you come across them at some of the oddest places. And there's a historical marker on McClendon Avenue, which is one of the streets um, uh, that uh, I would take from my brother's house into downtown Atlanta. And, uh, and the markers themselves sometimes have these titles, which uh, sometimes inadvertently have their own poetry or their own humor to them. And there was this one marker, and the title of the marker is Sweeney's Encampment. Sweeney's Encampment is the title of the poem as well. Historical marker, McClendon Avenue, Atlanta, Georgia. It is the one historical marker on McClendon Avenue I did not read regarding the Civil War or if I did, I forgot. It is on the edge of a park in the neighborhood known as Lake Clare, near Little Five Points, on the way to downtown, on the way to where you worked. I think Sweeney was part of Sherman's army. Forgive me if I've gotten it wrong, but what was left of your life filled every moment of mine. The drive through Lake Clare was a shortcut you showed me. If I knew then what I know now, I would have taken the longest way around, stopped at every marker of great or little significance. I would have insisted we both get out of the car, fingered the raised letters on each bronze marker, read the inscriptions out loud, consigned it all to memory. The historical fact, you me and the failing light of late September at the Emory Eye Clinic. My brother had the great good fortune of having, uh, he worked for uh, uh, the Trust Company Bank of Georgia. He had become a vice president uh, and it was then taken over by SunTrust and uh, the big banking gobbling up that happened in the 90s. Um, uh, but because of his position, he had wonderful health care, which a lot of people didn't have. And he was also, he had access to a lot of um, trials of experimental uh, medications and treatments there at Emory University. And uh, one of the things uh, at the um, uh, Emory Eye Clinic, and my brother uh, was part of a cohort of people who received uh, an implant actually into the eye itself. Uh, because in the early days of the epidemic, a lot of people were becoming blind from um, uh, CMV, which is uh, a CMV infection of the eye. And CMV is cytomegalovirus. And uh, this little implant uh, was actually almost like a, a, a time-released pump uh, that released medication into the eye, which prevented my brother from getting uh, this particular infection. And of this group of men in the cohort, he had absolutely uh, the best uh, results of anyone. And as a result, uh, his um, corneas were, were donated. And shortly after his death, um, this um, ocular implant uh, was approved by the FDA. And, and, and part of it was because of his work as a volunteer and as a member of that cohort. And this was a trip to the Emory Eye Clinic at the Emory Eye Clinic. Mm -hmm. In the lobby, plush with gray and purple chairs, we sit among old people, children with one eye bandaged, and the young men with AIDS, blind or nearly so, with CMV. Your implant has worked well, a beacon of sorts for the stunned and immobilized. Ironic, you see well, although your damaged brain is already leaking away all the words you have for the world. In the elevator, you ask me where we were. 
Across from us, two young men, drawn and wasted. One reaches with spectral hand and brushes the hair back from his companion's face, not once, but two or three times, as if to say, look, honey, we're in this together. I'm here. Instinctively, I take your hand. This one is entitled Joseph at Huntington Gardens. And my brother, in the early stages of his illness, did make a trip to California, and uh, I took him to Huntington Gardens, and we walked around. And he liked it very much and wanted, would have liked to have returned. It is near winter in Decatur. If you were well, I would take you to San Marino, the lush enclave near Pasadena, escort you through the Huntington Gardens up to the tea house and the raked gravel of the Zen garden, where we would contemplate the mysteries of three maples, rocks which are both mountain and island, the perfection of bonsai. Tell me, is it true that death distills this world into one place that is everywhere and here in the same breath? I want to believe, Joseph, when I look at the red-orange moon bridge, its reflection in the water completing the perfect O of eternity, that you and I are seeing it with the same eyes, that I feel your breath, hear your excited whisper, look, look. How fever transforms us. It was the last night of your life. You had abandoned language. Your body was full of fever. Like a night in August, like a bonfire consuming the very air in the room of your unmaking. In your presence, in the absence of air, what do I breathe, brother, other than silence? What do I breathe? This poem, oddly enough, even though it ended in this collection, it was the title poem of my first book. And it was actually the poem that, uh, that I wrote in response to my brother telling me in uh, 1990 or 91, 91, I think, uh, that he was HIV positive. And at that time, as a social worker, I was working, I was doing some work uh, for the state office AIDS as, as, a, as an educator. Uh, and I already knew at that point the implications of uh, my brother's, uh, the information my brother was giving me. And, and I think this poem was my working through uh, my own, you know, anxiety and, and concern and also uh, trying uh, to come to uh, some term with uh, my, uh, my already anticipatory grieving of, of his death. Swimming past Iceland. I have been told that people with pneumonia drown, so I imagine him swimming away. I buy freesias for his room, bring a perfect nest blown from an olive tree, does it belong to a shrike or Phoebe? My brother does not answer. He is swimming, they tell me, somewhere near the horizon, nearly out of sight. I spend the afternoon cooking lentils, baking bread. Perhaps he will swim back for dinner, wet and hungry. I smooth his sheets, read, imagine him out in the dark. I am afraid to wade after him. Is he cold, I wonder? I put my ear to his lips, breath rasps in time with his strokes. As a child, he threatened to swim to England. In last night's fevered dream, he cleared the coast of Labrador, Greenland by dawn. He woke smiling. Ice, he says. 
I put ice to his lips. He is hot and cold like Iceland in the children's book about volcanoes. He paces himself almost there. Home, he says, off the coast of Iceland. He is exhausted. Even in my dream, waist deep in the icy cold, he has made Iceland, passed it, too exhausted for England, too tired to return. He is drowning out there, spent swimmer, off some distant coast, after all the stragglers and generations caught sleeping in hospitals next to the bed of someone with pneumonia, drowning, dying, dreaming. Someone who swims from one fevered place to another, but never home. This is a poem in, entitled Emmaus, which is the, the name of a town uh, in the New Testament, in the book of Luke, and it is a story of one of the post-resurrection stories, and I took that town, that story, and rewrote it um, to express uh, a, a certain feeling of, of uh, loss uh, about my, my brother's death, although in truth, when the poem started, it wasn't about my brother uh, who had died a few years before, but then he sort of appeared in the poem, uh, and I decided uh, uh, to leave it be. He overtook me on the road to Emmaus, and we walked together, discussing what better path I might have taken given the lay of the land, whether or not the pass was closed. He so favored my dead brother, I asked him to suffer. And he said yes. The light, it seemed, followed us home, where he sat beside me at the table. I turned and reached for a plate of figs, turned back, to his empty chair. What did I expect in that chill autumnal air? El Dia de los Muertos. If the dead know anything at all that we do not, it is a long forgetting. And if by custom they gather on the turn of the year at the edge of life, who notices their silent waving, all their gestures of hello and goodbye? <laughs>